The things I wanted to talk about this exercise are, okay, what does toast have to do with computing? Nothing. Well, except it's delicious, <laughs> but nothing. But what does this problem have to do with computing? Well, everything. Because computing and engineering and science and probably everything worthwhile in life is really about solving problems, about using your mind to solve a problem. And the act of solving a problem is something that lots of people have theorized about how to do, but there's not even universal consensus on how we go about solving problems. Here's what I do know about problem solving. Faced with a hard problem like this, some people in the world will think, oh, I don't know how to do that, that's too hard. I'm not gonna do it, I give up. I, I don't know much about solving problems, but I know that is, that's bad. So if you did that, just, just think about it. Maybe you just weren't interested in toast. Maybe I didn't, I can't believe no one's interested, no one wouldn't be interested. Uh, so basically when you see a problem, step one is don't give up. <laughs> I'm not giving up. <laughs> don't give up, number one. So if you can't solve it, don't let that kill you. I remember once um, I, was, uh, I was driving a car. It was my parents' car. I just borrowed it. We were driving somewhere. We were miles away from anywhere. We went to a petrol station. I was with my girlfriend. I hadn't been driving very long. I uh, wasn't probably a good driver. And I... I was a bit nervous about the whole thing, and it was, I was filling the car up with petrol, and then I remembered whenever Dad goes on a long trip, he always tops up the oil, and I suddenly thought, I should be topping up the oil, we're on a long trip. So I went and asked for some oil from the man in the shop, and he gave me some oil, I hoped it was the right sort. I said, I'm with that car. And then I went out, and I lifted up the bonnet. Where do I put the oil? <laughs> I looked and looked and looked, and then I saw a little oily spot, and there was a little nozzle thing there, like a little screw cap, so I unscrewed it, Lifted it off and I poured the oil and the whole thing went in. I was thinking, this is a lot of oil all going in there. Then I put the lid back on and then I went to start the car. And you know what happened? The car wouldn't start. And I thought, oh no, I'm in trouble now. I'm miles away from anywhere. I'm just looking like an idiot in front of my girlfriend. And um, I can't get the car started. I've probably destroyed Dad's car by pouring oil into the transmission system or the, <laughs> the windscreen wipers or something. And I was just freaking out completely. So I stood there just staring at the car with the bonnet up. And a couple of other guys gathered around, and we all just stood there staring at the car with the bonnet up. And I thought, I'm stuffed. I'm going to have to call the NRMA. And one guy that was watching said, no, 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 it'll be fine. And uh, he just looked at it for a while and said, no, no, no. Ah, look at that. And there, look, the only thing I knew was electronics. And I'd done a unit at school called automotive electronics, bizarrely enough. So I knew one thing about cars, and that's I knew how a distributor and an alternator worked. The only thing I knew about cars, and he was pointing at the distributor cap, and there I'd knocked one of the leads off when I was putting the oil in. <laughs> I actually knew that. And he said, look, just put that back on. I plugged it on, started the car, the car started straight away. And I thought, oh, man, because I was sitting there telling myself I wasn't going to be able to solve this problem, even though the answer was right in front of me. And it took someone calm who was optimistic to just come up and see the answer was right in front. So giving up is never a solution in solving problems. If you can't work it out straight away, then solve a related smaller problem. Solve another problem completely. Get a friend to come and help you solve the problem. Look it up on the internet to get clues. Brainstorm about it. Dream. Go have a shower. Go for a walk. Just try random things, experiment with them. I don't know what it is, but you just can't stand still. You have to somehow keep progressing, keep trying in that optimistic frame of mind. So please, if you haven't yet worked out the toast thing, don't give up if you can't work out how to do it. Just think of a way. It might be wrong, but a wrong answer is heaps more impressive for me. Someone that tried and got it wrong, that got it completely wrong, is massively impressive to me than someone who was just as scared but didn't even start and thought, no, I can't do that. I'll wait and see what the answer is. Um, that works at school, but it doesn't really work at uni. So one is don't give up. Two is ask more questions, which you guys did already. Three is um, break it into parts. If you've got a problem and you just don't know how to solve it, try and break it into sub-problems. They're less daunting. And four, profit. <laughs> and five, five is probably the key one. You may well have been a person that didn't give up, you may well have known how to break into some problems. You may have done all that stuff, but you still might be caught out by number five. Five is when you get the answer, do you go, ah, I've got the answer, I can relax now? 
No, it turns out you don't do that. If you've got the answer, you think, all right, good, I'll write that one down. Now I'll try and solve it another way. And now I'll try and solve it another way. And now I'll try and solve it another way. And if at the end of the uni we've given you that spirit somehow, or you've given it to yourself somehow, we've succeeded. Because this is how you do computing, and I suspect this is how you do everything. You try the best you can, you get an answer, but you don't think, I've found the answer, now I can stop. Because answers can always be improved, especially for wishy-washy, ill-defined problems like how many pieces of toast you fit into the lecture theatre. There might be 50 ways of solving that problem. There might be a whole range of interesting things you can learn from each of those ways. So try multiple solutions. I'm going to give you an, a wishy-washy, ill-defined problem. First of all, actually, I'm going to tell you the real problem, but we're not going to solve it. And then I'll tell you a, a variant on that problem that's simpler that you can solve. This problem uh, actually arose when I was a young boy. Um, it's just uh, my, my father took me into the city to see um, something, a marching band. And he said, son, when you grow up, what are you going to do? What sort of person are you going to be? And I thought, oh, I thought first he was asking me what sort of job I was going to have. Like, was I going to be an accountant or a, a lawyer or a doctor? Because they were the only three professions I knew from watching TV. Or, no, or a policeman, a forensic policeman. Uh, but no, he wasn't asking that. I realized as I looked at him, it was like a pivotal moment in my life. He was really asking me what sort of person I wanted to be, what sort of life I wanted to live, what my goals and aspirations were, and all that sort of stuff. And I thought, oh, I don't know. And I, I just thought really long and hard about it. So that's my question for you that I don't think you can answer now, which is, you know, what do you want to be? Where do you want to be? What sort of life do you want to have? What do you want to do? What's your... when, when you're dead and people are looking at your tombstone uh, or, or, or giving your funeral address, what would you like that they were saying about you? Or, or what would you like to look back on on your deathbed and think, aha, or... Mm. Okay, that's the hard question. That's a really hard problem to solve. And when you've solved that, don't think, oh, I've solved that and keep going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You've got to keep coming up with new solutions for that one. But that's too hard for us to do now. But here's one you can do now. What do you want to get out of uni? Why are you at uni? What's the point of being here? What do you want? Not what do your parents want or I want. Because you can't... If you're not trying to solve that problem, you're going to spend four years here and they could be the four best and most formative years of your life or you could just waste them if you're just here without thinking while you're here. So what you've got to do is work out what do I want to do, why am I here, how do I want to change while I'm here, what can uni do for me, and then you've got to think about, well, how can I pull that off? Because here's where we're different to school. I'm not going to do it for you. No one's going to do it for you. Uni's just a whole lot of resources that you can access to do things. Don't wait till you've left uni and then look back and have regrets and think, I wish I had, I wish I'd done this, I wish I'd done that. Think what you want to do and then what you've got to do to achieve what you want to do. So that's your homework for next Wednesday. You don't have to tell anyone in the world except I want you to write it down somewhere. I want you to work out what you want to get out of uni, what your point of being here is, what your hopes are for uni. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was speaking to one of our um, tutors and she's really good, Nathania. And we were talking about uni and what uni's for and what you guys would be going through and how you know you're just starting and what you're thinking. And she said, surely, um, surely everyone here is just thinking uh, they just want to get a job. And surely that's what uni's about. It's just like a job training thing. You're just learning skills so you can get a job. And then you can earn some money and buy a house. And then I said, no, Nathaniel, no. no. Uh, there's got to be more to life than that. And so that's what I want you to think about. OK, so that's the hard problem. Now we're going to move on to the easy stuff. I have two things I want to say before we're done. I want to talk a little bit about um, high school. Uh, what do you think is different between uni and high school? This is your one chance yeah, to reflect. After today, you're never going to think about what uni's like. You're just going to be doing uni every day. And then you'll get to the end and you might look back and feel happy or sad or regretful. But today's your one chance to actually think about it. So how do you think uni's different to high school? Yeah, shoot. What's your name? You keep answering questions. I should give you a pixel too. What's your name? Uh, Callum. Callum. Do you want his pixel? <laughs> you could have like a thumb war to see who gets to keep it. No, pick two numbers. Uh, 42, 42, 40, oh, 42, 42. Theo's making a sad looking face in the back. Could you give him a pixel too somehow? We'll work out how to do it. So, Callum. All right, yeah, question. Um, do you want a pixel? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You can't have that pixel now. <laughs> no, I like, more yep. Yeah, so more independence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're reliant on yourself. Yeah, perfect, 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 perfect. Uni versus school. 
one, self-reliant. That's absolutely right. I don't know how to spell reliant, but that's absolutely right. You, it's only you that has control over what's going on at uni. Yeah? No one else really cares. Your tutor will care because they're a nice person, but they're not going to make it. It's not like school. Yeah. Uh, Jacob, and um, you've inspired me. I really want a pixel. You want a pixel? <laughs> that's, that's what I want out of uni. You want a pixel out of uni? I like the cut of your jib. I'm not going to give you a pixel because I want you to get used to disappointment. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, potential. Yeah, okay, the sky's the limit, really. You can do anything here. You're interested in anything, you can find someone. An awesome student here, Cameron, got really interested. Oh, Cameron, there you are! I was just about to talk about you. You got really interested in, well, you get interested in everything. What's the most recent thing? The mine thing. Mining, yeah. yeah, yeah, you got interested in mining, so you found some professors that were interested in mining, and then he found some companies that had some gear, and he found some problems that hadn't been solved, and he found some research that had happened in other places, and then he put it all together, and now you're running some sort of massive research, fantastic, incredible yeah, thing. It's fantastic. Yeah, he's a real, everyone should speak to Cameron because he's completely a legend. Why are you here? Just for fun. Why are you here? Oh, um, I was going to tell you after. Oh, okay, cool, cool. Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> yep, yeah, shoot. It's not, yeah, comp competition is just not important. At school, you're hunting for marks because you want to come first. Here, we don't care who comes first. In fact, if you come first in the course, you probably go, oh, you needed to get out more, man. <laughs> it's, because you're competing with yourself here. I know people say that all the time. It doesn't matter how you go compared to everyone else. In fact, these guys are going to be your friends and peers in the workforce. You're not trying to beat them. You're trying to work together, and you're trying to make yourself as awesome as you can in the threes you've got. Absolutely. What's your name? I'm Howard. Howard? Yeah. Thanks, Howard. Classes are interesting. Well, but what if they're not? Some of your classes will be boring. <laughs> Who has to solve that problem if you're at a class and it's not interesting? Yeah, you have to solve it. You have to work out a way of making it interesting to keep yourself awake so you learn the stuff because it's no skin off the lecturer's nose if you bomb out and don't learn that stuff. Set up last year. What did, what did Kitten do last year? He did something fantastic. Wait, is Kitten here too? I was just noticing a whole lot of ex-students are here. Kitten, he was doing, there was a course going and it wasn't going so well, so he set up an alternate stream of tutorials and lectures. And the students just ran them. They booked a hall and taught the course themselves. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's more flexible. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's this, again, it's up to you, so you can do whatever you want. I had some things. Um, the two things I wanted to uh, draw out were, one, at school, because you're sort of being driven by a test in the HSC, everything's sort of black and white, everything's right or wrong. I remember uh, one year we were talking about Blade Runner in class and someone came up to me afterwards and said, actually, actually, uh, Mr. Buckland, but call me Richard, he said, actually, Mr. Buckland, I, I didn't want to say it in the class, but we did Blade Runner at school, so I actually, I actually know what it's about. And I actually, I know all the answers to, you know, all things we're talking about. And I'm like, whoa! Because no one ever knows anything. How could a teacher at school ever tell you that you knew something? All it is is just opinions and thoughts. So don't ever think there's a right and wrong answer. There's 50 million right answers and 50 million wrong answers. And some of the wrong answers are actually right, which is really interesting. So uni's all about the shades of grey, just like life. So it's not the black and white. I don't want you to be coming up to me saying, is this right or is this right? Sometimes they're both right. Or sometimes, I have, you know, it depends on more questions. Shades of grey. And the other thing is, not black and white, scepticism. That we want you to become thinkers, and thinkers means you're sceptical, which means you don't just believe what I say, and you don't believe what the textbook says, and you don't believe what anyone says. You test everything, and you check it out. Like the guy that was asking, was it you again? That was asking for the correlations. I was telling you some correlation. He wanted to see the numbers. He was being sceptical. That's fantastic. So last year, um, I did actually do some experiments with encouraging scepticism by uh, lying to the students repeatedly throughout lectures about things. Uh, it was a fantastic experiment. I might do that again this year. Uh, and the last thing is, I think... Um, Uni should be like a really fun book. I thought that this morning because I saw this awesome book called Stirring Deeds of Britain's Sea Dogs. And it's just a ripping yarn full of fantastic adventures. And I thought, why isn't uni like this? Why is uni like a boring textbook? It should just be fantastic. You should just want to keep reading and keep learning and mastering the next thing and the next thing. And it should be, at the end, you know all this stuff and it's fantastic. So I'm going to actually relabel this book. I thought it could be the book for our course. It's not Stirring Deeds of Britain's Sea Dogs. It's... Computing One. <laughs> right, this is our awesome book. I've talked about problem solving. The last thing I want to talk about is a theme that's going to be popping up all the time in this course. And it's something called abstraction. Abstraction is something we're going to be doing heaps in this course. So let me introduce the concept of abstraction to you today so I can pick it up on Wednesday when we go. Abstra Has anyone seen the film Blade Runner? Does anyone know the answer, what it's all really about? No, I'm <laughs> In that film, there's this awesome thing where Deckard 
or Decker or whatever his name is, I don't even know that, uh, was looking at a picture and he starts zooming in. Has everyone seen that? And he keeps going, he says enhance or something. He's got a voice operator computer, so he goes enhance, 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 and it's zooming in like that crazy um, uh, Mel Brooks film. And it's just zooming in and zooming in and zooming in. But then the cool thing is that he starts panning around the zoomed picture, and I think he gets to go around a corner. And then he finds a mirror and he zooms in on the mirror and he finds a tiny thing reflected on the other side of the room. And then he zooms into that thing and it's something that has a little shadow that he zooms into and he finds the manufacturer's mark engraved in microscopic writing on something that's about 50 kilometers away. This is what we mean by abstraction. Enhance is going in, abstraction is coming out. So abstraction is the art of seeing things at different levels. I've got two examples of that. Example one is the human body. I am Richard, but I also am, what else am I? What's that? A meat popsicle. <laughs> I am a bazillion cells. Which is the true story? Am I a bazillion cells or am I Richard? Well, I'm both. They're both describing me. One's not right and one's not wrong. They're just different levels of abstraction. They're different ways of looking at the same thing. But my cells are made up of chemicals and sodium pumps. So I'm a whole lot of organic molecules. But I'm a whole lot of organic molecules, or am I a whole lot of cells, or am I Richard? I'm all of them. And depending on what problem you're trying to solve, it's interesting to look at those different levels. But it's the same thing. If you could only go through life seeing everyone, oh well, those organic chemicals are made up of elements. So I'm just a whole lot of atoms. But those atoms are made up of subatomic particles, so I'm just a whole lot of subatomic particles. Although that is the truth, it's not useful in dealing with me if you're asking, you know, trying to make me happy or give me a birthday present, to think of me as a whole lot of subatomic particles. It's not useful for you if you're a doctor trying to cure my cancer to think of me as a university lecturer. You want to think of me as a lymphatic system connected to this system. Depending on the different problems, there's different ways of viewing things. These are called abstraction. We'll be doing that a lot in this course. Flipping our levels of abstraction, enhancing, going down, and then abstracting, going back up, trying to find the right level to solve a problem. It turns out if you do everything at the atom level, everything gets very complicated very quickly and you can't do anything. But if you do everything at the top level, everything's wishy-washy and you can't do everything. So the art of programming, or I reckon of problem solving, is you're just moving up and down levels of abstraction all the time. The other example of abstraction I've got is because at the moment I'm trying to write a book. I want to be a novelist. I want to write a book about teaching. I'm trying really hard to write this book. And it struck me that a book is just a whole lot of letters. And that's true. And if I'm a typesetter, that's interesting. If I'm typesetting Shakespeare, they'd run out of Ws. So they used to put two Vs in. So the typesetters would just be thinking about it as letters. But a person reading it thinks about it as words. So a book is a whole lot of words. But is a book just a whole lot of words? No, what's a book? It's ideas, it's chapters, it's plot, it's characters. There's all these different levels at which you can look at a book. I was hearing some research recently about Agatha Christie. Someone went through counting the words in Agatha Christie books. They counted the frequency of each word in her books, in the individual books. They found a signature that her books had a certain size vocabulary up until her last book, which I think was number 72. I heard this on Radio Lab, that awesome radio science show thing. At book number 72, suddenly they found the size of her vocabulary dropped by 20 or 30%. And her pattern of word usage changed. Now, if you're a sceptical person like me, I'd be thinking, oh, plagiarism. <laughs> She's getting someone else to write a book. But actually, it turns out they think that she developed Alzheimer's. And this was a key, a tag, an indicator that she was changing. So at that level, counting the number of words is interesting. You could do it to Shakespeare. He has a huge number of words. When I've done an analysis on Shakespeare, my theory is that Shakespeare was actually written by a couple of different people. Oh, <laughs> what a nut I am. <laughs> So, do you understand the notion of abstraction and difference and things like that? Okay, we'll be talking about that heaps. And just before you go, last question. What is this? What is it? Does anyone know? Yes, what is it? A player piano. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is a song. A player piano, you'd feed this piece of paper into it, it would play a song. So my question for you, in addition to the other question I've already asked you to solve, is this. Is a player piano and this, is that a computer? Is that not a computer? I don't want you to call it out now, I want you to think about it. And when you know the answer, what do I want you to do? Keep thinking about it. Yeah, okay. Is it a computer? If so, why? If not, why not?
Turned out nice again, hasn't it? Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you on Wednesday. It's up there now. So if they follow you, you'll take them to a barbecue with free food? Free food if you follow these guys. Follow the guy with the pipe. Want to catch me just outside this? After this, I'll just pack up and go outside. I'm just gonna say thank you for this. Oh, there's no worries at all. There's no worries at all. Are you okay? Is everything yeah, yeah. good? I'm fantastic. That's fantastic. All right, congratulations. I'm really pleased. I knew you would. Thank you. See ya.